I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Gorlin, who serves as McLaren Engineering Group's Vice President of Entertainment Division. A, he is a graduate of Cornell University in engineering. Uh, he is registered as a PE in 18 states and a board certified structural engineer. His more than 30 years of experience include engineering of scenic entertainment and amusement structure, staging, rigging, buildings, show action equipment, scenic elements, architectural theming, sculptures, and other frameworks worldwide. Mr. Gorlin is a member of the ESTA Rigging Working Group, including serving as its Performing, Flying, and Temporary Structures Task Group, American Society of Civil Engineers, Cornell Society of Engineers, and Structural Engineer Associates of New York. He has published articles in Architectural Week and in Structural Engineering Forums, and is a frequent lecturer at various universities and industry conventions. I'd like to welcome Bill to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. All right, can those in the back hear me? Great. Um, it's the 62446 number is today's number. I'm doing it again tomorrow, and I may change it up. That'll be the second number. For those of you in the back, please come forward. This is supposed to be a, an enjoyable, fun session, okay? Um, we're going to be talking about entertainment, okay? I might do a little singing and dancing if you're not careful. Um, I'd like to make this a, an, an enjoyable experience. So um, if there's a lot of the, the projects and examples I'm going to give may not be that familiar to some of you, or at least the basic subject matter will, but not the application to, in engineering. Um, so I welcome... Raise your hand, okay? If you have a question about something we're talking about, raise your hand, we'll talk about it. Um, I have a lot of material. We may not get to all of it. I really don't care. I just want to make it a nice, fun session. Um, if I don't see your hand, just speak up, okay? This is, this is meant to be kind of a little free form, a little fun, okay? So, entertaining with steel. Okay, so, Matt introduced me. I, uh, how did I get into this business, you, you may be wondering. Um, you know, I, I graduated from school doing structural engineering. I went to work for a company doing buildings, and you know, that's where I thought my career was headed. Uh, and then we had a, a client walk in the door who, had, who was from a scenic studio. And my boss pointed to me and said, Bill, you like weird stuff. You work with these guys. And I, I just rode that ship with them, and I'm still, still on that ship. Um, it just so happened that um, the theater industry changed and I was there for the moment that it was changing. I just didn't realize it until I became a lot, of, a lot older. In theaters, the head carpenter is the head technical person. Today, he barely works with wood, but he's still called a carpenter. The company that, was my, uh, that I consulted with and another, their competitor in the mid-'80s changed everything from wood to steel because steel was starting to become readily available, something good to work with. There were many advantages. So I was there for the revolution in, in, uh, in the theatrical scenery industry, changing from wood to steel. What you see here is a, is a concert tour. We'll, we'll show some more photographs of this later. Okay, entertainment. What, what are, when I talk about entertainment, I'm referring to the use, engineering that supports a whole wide variety of industries where the main focus is entertaining people, providing an enjoyable experience, an enjoyable environment. So we have entertainment facilities, theaters, performing arts centers, etc. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go flip the next page quickly, but there's you know scenery and touring stages, um, rigging and theatrical structures. And this is theatrical rigging, which is similar to construction rigging in some ways. Um, themed architectural elements and sculptures mechanized effects and entertainment equipment, amusement rides and devices, television, film production, and live events and concert tours. And you can see they kind of overlap with one another, um, but they, they are to some degree distinct in, in how they, uh, the peculiarities of these various industries. Okay, entertainment facilities. So theatrical infrastructure, um, overhead rigging, in theaters, gridirons, loft beams, head beams, pin rails, rigging points, lighting support booms and pipes. I suspect some of you aren't familiar with some of these, but essentially it's the infrastructure to allow you to present a show and with moving elements, or with lighting, sound. Um, 
And of course, the building structures. You know, a theater is a machine. It's not a building. Okay? It's a machine that allows you to put on a show. Okay? An arena, in some ways, is a machine that allows you to, to rig a concert. Um, they, they are very special purpose-built facilities. Scenery and touring stages. Um, al aluminum has a big presence in this industry, uh, but there are places where aluminum can't do the job and steel rules. The biggest, heaviest uh, touring stages are steel. Um, there are mobile stages that you know, ride on the, you know, on the highways and arrive in a site and unfold. They're all made out of steel. Some of the decking systems are steel. There's a company called Steel Deck. I don't know if that thing even works or not. Um, but uh, Steel Deck has a steel system, and their advantages are simply it's steel. You can throw it around, and it won't get dinged the way aluminum might. Um, light gauge tube is often used for scenery flats. Once again, in the old days, you had 2 by 4 wood. Now you have 2 by 2 by 14 gauge steel. Theatrical structures and rigging. Um, the equipment, the shiv blocks, the counterweight arbors, the electric winches, lifts, turntables, any, a whole wide variety of, of machinery. Um, the pipes that are flown and, and trusses that are flown overhead. And, and of course the racks and, and, and handling elements for the machinery. In addition, there were themed elements in sculptures. Um, exposed structural steel. It can be inside finishes. It can be stain, exposed stainless. Uh, it's a wide variety of uses. Um, once again, I mentioned mechanized effects and entertainment equipment. It could be a retractable roof. You might consider that entertainment. You might consider that building. It might be an LED screen that in the Cowboy Stadium is one that spins around. Um, a wide variety of uses. And of course, the amusement industry. Roller coaster, the tracks, the vehicle chassis. Uh, the dark ride uh, effects. And of course, live events and concert tours again. You know, I mentioned the concert tours, but there are also one off concerts and there are also promotional events. Um, I'm, in, I'm from New York. We have a Times Square is almost every day filled up with something to promote some product. And they're using some, some you know, interesting temporary uh, structural elements for these. And then television film production, very much like theater, but it has its own peculiarities. Okay, let's look at one example. Okay, this is the uh, U2360 tour. Um, this was one of the largest stadium tours ever built. U2 draws a lot of money so they can afford to do something like this. Um, what we see on the left is what they call the claw structure. Okay, it's a very large steel structure. This gets erected in the stadium. And it's you know, it's it's exciting thing for the public to see. So it's, just, it's, a, it's really a sculptural element, but it's, it's holding... Um, a bunch of visual and, and, and uh, production-related elements. You can see in the upper right, um, the, the crane is lifting the structures into place. Uh, the lower right, you can see there's a, a connection. Notice that that's not, you know, an A490 or A325 bolt. Okay, it's a pin. Okay, to put that pin in will take 30 seconds. To put a bolt in might take three minutes. Okay, that extra two and a half minutes is could make or break a show when you add it up across many connections. The way they do some of these very large tours, for this show, they had three of these major structures, and they would call it leapfrogging. They have three different sites where they're, two sites where they're building, and then one site that they hit were a finishing building, then all the show equipment, the stage, the speakers, the LED screens, the lighting, that arrives, gets attached to this structure. When the show's over, it comes down, it goes to the next stadium site, where that claw structure has is just been finished and gets erected there. So it's a pretty ambitious uh, way to do a tour. Any questions? Okay. What are some of the advantages of steel over other materials? Now, I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with these, but in the entertainment bi business, we often have to convince people that steel might be better than aluminum or better than wood. Um, the, you know, it's readily available throughout the world. If you have a world tour and something goes wrong, you might not be able to get the kind of aluminum that you can get in the United States in Asia. So steel's readily available everywhere. Um, it's familiar to workers, and you have skilled labor throughout the world. It's stiff. Huge advantage when you're dealing with aesthetic uh, treatments. Um, and, and, of course, it's strong. 
Steel's a fatigue resistant. Okay, if you beat it up on a truck during a tour, it's, it's more likely to survive than some of the other materials. Impact resistance, we have things that fly, that move around. Um, it, it's a huge benefit. Um, failure is typically ductile, right? That's, a lot of people in the entertainment business don't appreciate that. We engineers do, and we try to educate these folks that if, you, if there's going to be failure, you want it to be a ductile failure, not a sudden one. Non-combustible, easy to paint, big deal, okay? So, you know, roller coasters, they, they need to be beautiful and the color needs to be able to be retained for many years. The steel's a lot easier to, you know, paint the way you wish. Um, it warps less than other materials when welded, and it's an efficient ballast, okay? When you have a, a, a big tour um, and you have, you're fighting for space, steel is, uh, lead is the best, but you're not allowed to use it. So steel is the next best in being being heavy. Okay. Uh, who cares? This is a this is a conference on steel, right? Okay. No. Okay. So here's some disadvantages of steel compared to other materials. Um, but uh, so what? Right? Um, you know, <laughs> steel is still probably the best material in the business. I'm going to let you look at those. I'm going to pass by this because uh, we're here for, to, to celebrate steel. Okay. Raise your hand if you're bored seeing a bunch of words you want to see pictures. Good. Let's get on with this. Let's take a trip around the world and look at some fun projects. We're going to start with in Macau. Okay, Macau is like the smallest country in the world practically. It's now owned by China. It's the, it has taken over Las Vegas as the world's gambling capital. It's a 45-minute ferry ride away from Hong Kong in Southeast Asia. Um, this was a project that we did for, for Wynn in their uh, second casino in Macau, the Wynn Palace Koh Tai. They have a, a, a lake with a water fountain, kind of like Bellagio in Las Vegas, but they wanted to outdo that casino. So they have a, a, a gondola, which is, it go, goes, basically goes around a loop, and it's, it's there for the viewing pleasure of, of their patrons. Of course, they wanted to have the most beautiful gondola system, and there are several uh, uh, places where they have to change the direction of the gondola rope. And so they wanted towers that were not your typical ones you would see in a ski resort. They wanted sculptural ta towers that look like a dragon. The manufacturer of the gondola system really just couldn't wrap their heads around something weird. So we were called in because we can deal with the weird. Uh, it was a great design team. Um, uh, Michael Curry, who is the designer who did all the puppetry for Lion King, he was brought in to do the sculpt of, the, of this dragon. And so we had to figure out how to do this dragon. And it was quite quite challenging. I mean, you can just see by the scale, um, you know, you can fit a, a person inside the, you know, the, the nose of this dragon. So it's about 60 feet tall. Uh, the, uh, the bull wheel is on a gondola is, is, is attached to a, a, a counterweight and it, for the, mo the, the force in the cable is pretty consistent. Um, what it does is it, it, you know, if there's more weight in the, in the uh, gondolas, then the cable sags more. It actually pulls on the on the counterweight so that you have pretty much an equal force in the, in the rope throughout. In order to resist the tendency of this head to be pulled backwards, we have cable stays that, that hold on to the neck and they, they do a balancing act. Not really your normal kind of design. Here's just another photograph of, uh, of, of the gondola system. So we were tasked with the, figuring out how to do this. And we had two manufacturers. We had a manufacturer of the Dragon Tower and the manufacturer of the gondola, and also the general contractor. And um, gondola manufacturers in Europe, the uh, Dragon manufacturer was in Canada, the contractors were in Asia. Okay, just imagine the chaos. Okay. We had to do the drawings in both the English and Chinese. Um, steel was the obvious choice for the skeleton of this dragon. So we had a well-defined triangulated skeleton, and it was clad with a compl complicated framework to support the, um, the, the fiberglass for the shell of the dragon. And you, as you can imagine, the steel needs to get out of the way of the shell, not the other way around. So it's a challenging negotiation structurally. Uh, there's about a million and a half dollars of 
go, gilded gold per dragon. Okay. Real gold. Yes. <laughs> it's it's gold leaf that gets gilded onto the fiberglass. Yeah. Win win creates money in their casino. Okay. So here's just a, a, a uh, image of one of our drawings. It, it's not meant for you to examine the details, but essentially you can see um, that there is a, a, a frame, a skeleton within the body of this thing. And what we had to consider was obviously appropriate stiffness. Um, we had to provide room on the inside for the equipment. We had to provide a ladder up the neck. So we essentially did sort of a tubular type configuration. Um, we had to allow for these five cable stays to be attached and then inspected. Um, and, uh, it, and the erection sequence was brutal. Uh, the, if you look at the, 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 the little ellipse that I drew, um, that's zooming out on the head. We're, we were supporting the bullwheel of the gondola provided by another manufacturer. Um, at 60 feet up in the air, we had to, the, the resulting, uh, the center point of that bullwheel was in a one inch radius sphere. That was the tolerance we were allowed to hit. 60 feet up in the air, which was brutal, to be honest with you. So what we ended up doing, looking on the right, uh, there are some images of the various elements that we designed to give us uh, five degree of freedom, five degrees of adjustment. Um, the only one that we did not have was side to side. We did that at the base of the columns. But we couldn't adjust the base like you would with a normal column when this thing was erected because the head was leaning over. And so it was a real balancing act of, of forces. Um, here's just zooming in a little bit more. We had some finite element modeling of pieces of the of the uh, of the the body. The um, here we go. actually is that working? There we go. So this is imagine that's the face, and this is you know the the main skull. <laughs> and so we had um, some uh, as few anchor bolts as few bolts as possible with spherical washers that allowed us to adjust it up and down, left and right, and vertically at this interface with this green element. The green element then had some uh, Teflon pads that would align this, the green to the purple when it was being adjusted. And then on top of the purple, pardon me, on top of the green was the red, which had some bolts connecting with lo longitudinal slots. So you could adjust the red to the green and adjust the green to the purple and on front of the red was the bull wheel. And we had to do with this up in the air under load. So we had a whole series of, of pack hydraulic uh, pancake actuators that would push it in a variety of directions to align under load, which was quite intense. And then when we were done pushing it, we had right here, we had some tie rods that would then lock it off. So um, pretty intense design. And then here's a photo under construction. We had uh, some shores that held, held up the neck. And then there was a, an interesting handoff. We, they put in, we put in the, uh, the tie rods and then put the bull reel rope on. And then at some point, this, if you see that there were, the, the pin was released. And when the strut came off, then we knew that it wasn't picking, taking load anymore. And then there was a balance between the, the cable stays and the bull wheel. Um, notice the shroud over the face of the dragon in Chinese culture. It's bad luck to reveal the face of a, a revered um, uh, character like a, a dragon, so they had to cover it up. Um, the other interesting thing is you can see these, these cable stays, this one and this one, are structural. There are another, there's one, another one that's supposed to go here. And, and two more below that. Those were non-structural, but we had to put them in as pseudo-structural. Um, we couldn't use two because that was not good luck. Five was a good luck number, and we got a lot of pushback about the aesthetics. In order to make the other, those three faux rods take as little load as possible, we made them hollow tubes, but the same diameter as everything else. But we were worried about vibrations in the wind. So we did a you know, typical cable stay type analysis that you would with a bridge, look at vibrations, 
and so we had to have enough pretension so that they wouldn't vibrate under you know anything but you know very extreme winds. So it was, it was a strange balancing act. Um, this picture of me is inside the neck. Imagine you're looking up inside the neck of the beast, up the ladder, just to give you a sense of the scale and and configuration. So it was an interesting one. Any questions about the dragon towers? Yes, in the back. So the question is, how do you determine the live load? That's a good, that is a very challenging question. In this case, um, the, the, lo we, the local code requires uh, serviceability wind as well as worst case wind. And there's a point at which the manufacturer of the gondola requires that the gondola cabins come off. And so that changes the loading configuration. There's also a scenario in which if the rope slips off of the shivs, we need to be able to resist the worst typhoon loads. There are also earthquake loads, uh, temperature loads. As far as live loads, it's actually, they're, they're, if I can go back a little bit, the only live load is vibrations due to the, to the, uh, the bull wheel turning. There is a, a, a forcing frequency of the rope, and it's really about the lay of the rope, the twist of the, of the, of the wires that make the rope. That gives you a certain forcing frequency. We had to demonstrate to the reviewers that that didn't, that was not proving to be a problem. And then you have the cabins, which you can see in red. And the cabin weight is, is very little compared to the overall system. So the actual live load was, was several thousand pounds that we had to contend with. Um, we also, we were subject to a uh, TUV uh, review. TUV is the German certifying agency that will drive you mad because they're very, very thorough and they know what they're doing. And um, we had to give them several thousand pages of calculations and over the course of six months, we eventually received approval from them. So, good question. Thank you. Let me... Any other questions? You, yes, sir. How do you estimate your, your speed? Do you do measure meridians? Are you <laughs> yes, that's true. How do you estimate a fee like this? Well, carefully and conservatively. Uh, that it, well, you know, we did it up a, a schematic design, and then after doing schematic design, then we, we we revised the fee based on what the final design would be. It it it, it some of this is uh, it, it it we do a design con a concept design with a very robust performance specifications what it needs to achieve, and then the the uh, the owner selected a contractor and then required that we work very, very closely with the contractor throughout, the, throughout all of the work. We've had other projects with this client where we've actually had to supply a person to stay with the project through fabrication and installation. It's not easy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? How long did it take to design and then get the construction ready? Uh, the design was, I would say, about a year and a half. And it went through some interesting iterations, um, many of which had to do with the creative development of the form of the dragon, because uh, the initial forms did not make Mr. Wynn happy. And he's a man who has, has very, very high standards for aesthetics. And actually, it's a good thing that he really pushed hard, because the, fu the final configuration was, was really beautiful. Um, so that was about a year and a half. The fabrication and installation was about it kind of overlapped a little bit, um, but it was a, a little over a year. So it was a very, very fast project, and there was not an opportunity to do any mock-ups other than the aesthetic mock-ups. So it was, you know, there were a couple of wake, you know, times of waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and, you know, running to, in the next morning to make sure we did something right. Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's go to Las Vegas, right? now the second greatest gambling place in the country, in the world. And we have done work with every single Cirque du Soleil show. We've done amusement rides. We've done all sorts of architectural theming. Um, but I found a, uh, literally on the plane or uh, last week, <laughs> remembered a project we did that has big steel. So I wanted to show this to you. 
This is the, uh, uh, the tree house at the Crystals at City, City Center. Um, what you're looking at is a restaurant. So inside of this are tables and people eating at the tables. And it's part of a whole retail mall. So that's a lower floor. This is the, the mezzanine level, which matches where this sort of onion-shaped restaurant is. And then this upper part is just for fun. It's all for fun. Um, but what's interesting here is what you, what lo it's, it looks like a big wood sculpture. Essentially, somebody went to AutoCAD and cut slices in two directions and said, hey, this looks cool. Let's build it. Okay. And, and we bitched and moaned about this, but we ended up figuring it out. And you notice that there are, in all the horizon horizontal-ish members, you see lighting that is you know, illuminating those strips. And it's all very clean. Um, the next photo is under construction. It was all structural steel. Okay, this was done by a shop the size of this room with very little overhead rigging, but a, a specialty scenic uh, company that has a lot of attention to detail. Um, every single element is completely unique. We designed everything to be tubular because of the strange forces in, you know, in, in all of the members. Everything is a custom tube and a custom cross-section. So um, essentially, the, the tubes were cutouts of plates, and then we had roll plates forming the other two sides. And they were connected with tab and with you know, like a jigsaw puzzle so that they could be aligned. Um, the, al the alignment that we were required to have here was had tighter tolerances than the, the architecture exposed structural steel requirements. And we couldn't see any exposed bolts and we had to accommodate all the electrical wiring. So it was a, it was a brutal project. Um, so you can see things s such as, you know, these rectangles are connecting plates and the nuts are on the inside of the beams and there were little access holes to reach them. Um, splices of columns have internally sleeved plates and, flat and countersunk bolts so that everything is flush. And then when they were done with all of the wood, then they clad it, pardon me, done with all the steel, then they clad it with, you know, with wood. But uh, the demands of the owner were, were pretty intense. And now we're going to zoom in on some of the details. Once again, here are the, some various horizontal beams. This is a, you know, like an S-shaped beam. Um, we had uh, the top and bottom flange. It was based, sort of an H cross-section. Not an H cross, a double H cross section. Essentially, the flanges overhang the two webs because we needed a place to put the wiring where we had wiring. We needed a way to attach the wood. Um, so if you look at in here, you can see two bolts, and there are two on the far side, but there are also two on the inside because we needed some very, very strong connections. Also, look at you know the fit-up. I mean, every single fit-up was different than every other one. Okay, now I'm going to, you know, looking a little closer, um, this little cutout was to accommodate an electrical wireway. Um, you know, we had stiffening plates that you can, uh, the evidence of, that you can see aligning with all the connections. Access holes to get in and, and, and make up the bolts on the inside. We actually modeled or the, uh, the, the detailer actually modeled the reach to get in there with a wrench to, attack, to make all the bolted connections. Here we are in the shop with a nice cup of coffee. And uh, you know, this is a column splice. What's interesting about this column splice is the piece below had vertical plates that it was slid up into this slot. And then these splice bolts engage that plate on the inside in tapped holes, and then we have countersunk holes in the plate so that you could hide the bolts so they wouldn't interfere with the wood cladding. And then there were little, you know, little holes here for wireways and, and reaching. So the, I mean, the level of detail on this was, you know, was quite intense. Um, this is not meant for you to examine. This is just a, a, a sampling of some of the details that we had for you know, one of the elements. You know, I, my pointer's not very good. Um, 
you know, here's, a, here's that a bolting interface plate where essentially we're slipping in, replacing the wall with a localized plate that was thick, welded from both sides, um, that, that could handle the local forces from, the, from the, uh, uh, the, the highly concentrated forces. But you can see all the alignment was completely unique throughout. Any comments or questions so far? Okay. And here's just another photo of the finished piece. So it's, um, it's just proved to be very successful. People love it. It's, uh, it's very unusual. Um, you can imagine how this thing behaves under earthquake loads. Las Vegas is a pretty serious earthquake zone, and it's just a highly irregular structure. Um, so, uh, and we're tied into the existing mezzanine, so we had very high seismic coefficients compared to a building structure. So any questions about the treehouse? All right. Let's see where we're going to go next. New York City. Okay, this is an amusement ride. It's kind of an unusual one. It's actually not a thrill ride. It's the anti-thrill ride. It's, it's an attraction. And this was dreamed up by the people who run the, the Battery Conservancy, which is at the southern tip of Manhattan. And they wanted uh, an, an experience that would bring people back to the experience they had, uh, I don't know, in the early 1900s when there was an aquarium at the Battery. So with, it, with a, a, a designer who, was, I think, who did, I think, the Sochi Olympics design, um, they came up with um, a building that would emulate a conch shell in its form and a ride experience with audio, visual, and you would be floating in a school of fish. So it's, it's part theater and part amusement ride. Now, according to the, you know, the regulatory uh, folks in New York City, it's an amusement ride because you have the public on something. So we had to comply with all the amusement ride standards. Uh, but it's also a big structure, and it also is an aesthetic structure. So what you see uh, on the left is, is the building, which is a fascinating shape, um, uh, done by, uh, not by my firm, by a different firm that we collaborated with. And then we did the ride system, which has a bunch of, bunch of fish. It's, it was discussed, described as a carousel because it rotates. But a traditional carousel, well, let, me, let me go to another picture and then I'll, I'll get into the, the ride system. Let me first talk about the building, then I'll get back to the ride system. Um, this was a fascinating building design because it was all tubular uh, uh, elements. And it was kind of a Rube Goldberg. And so they had to shore the, 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 the apex of the roof until all the pieces were put together, and every, you know, nothing really fit. Nothing was the same except at the, uh, at the base. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an exciting shape, and uh, they, I think they did a fine job. If you notice on the, uh, on the right side, you know, the, similar to some of the stuff I had to do in the treehouse, on this one they had to do connections that were kind of hidden within the cross-section of, of the tubular members, so, um, you know, to maintain the look. Now here uh, on the left is, is a cross-section of a 3D of our, our, our design where the ride system is the you know, double-decker turntable on the bottom uh, within the building. Um, on the right is a photograph of the, of the ride system, which is a, the carousel. A traditional old-fashioned carousel with horses is essentially one turntable with a bunch of linkages and the linkages make the horses go up and down in a repetitive fashion. In this case, they didn't want anything overhead, and they wanted the ability for the fish, rather than the horses, to, to swim about as if they were schools of fish, to be programmed. So there are 25 axes of motion, so 25 different things that move, okay? So uh, if you look on the left, there are three small turntables in one big turntable. On each small turntable are six masts, each mass holds a fish. Those groups of six fish, three rotate one direction, and the other three rotate another direction. And what ends up happening is if you have the big turntable going one direction, and the small turntables kind of go back and forth, you actually get a m magical moment in which you're standing still for a split second, and the world is spinning around you very gently. And nobody really understood this. And that what the designer was saying for a couple of years until we actually experienced it. And it's a pretty, pretty cool experience. But we gave them the machinery and the structures to make it happen. Um, if in the photo, 
Um, I made a big point of making sure that we had very different colors for the different moving elements so that orange was the small turntable and blue was the big turntable so you can keep track of where you are. Um, both it helps the maintenance people. Also, if for some crazy reason there's a maintenance guy in there and a thing starts moving, he jumps to one color. Um, so because this is in a, in a cellar in you know just a few feet uh, above uh, sea level, um, we put as much of the machinery up high as we could in case there was a flood. During Hurricane Sandy, uh, the water came within one foot of the main floor of the system. So um, everything's electric. We didn't want to deal with hydraulics because that would require special uh, training. Uh, but it was a big structure. We have spinning loads. Um, we have uh, emergency stop loads. We have fatigue cycles. So we have, if you see, you can see there's a lot of bracing for the structure. Uh, just zooming in just a little bit, this is a, just an image of the large turntable with the three turntables missing. It has, a, it has wheels, th uh, three concentric rings of wheels that ride on tracks that are on the concrete slab on grade. And at the center, there's a, a five foot diameter ring bearing, which is like a crane bearing. To, to ensure this, that the thing is centered. That's where all the electrical communication comes up through a electrical slip ring. You can see in the center of each of these turntables is another five foot diameter ring bearing. The reason they're all five foot, ring, five foot diameter is I, we didn't want to have a fourth that was a different size because we wanted to order them all at the same time. <laughs> um, these carry the small turntables. Small turntables um, are sort of a mushroom design where it just bears on the, on the ring bearing so that we have a really, really good quality support and good quality rotational um, consistency. And the, we have these machines, all custom-made machines that raise and lower the fish. And each machine, which you can see here, actually best viewed in this view, we designed this so that you could lift each one undo with four bolts, lift it out of a hatch, and take it out for service. We coordinated this with the roof designer. We asked, at every intersection above the ride system, we asked him for a rigging point that would be able to hold uh, a one-ton chain hoist that could lift these uh, out of place. And you know, there was a you know well-coordinated building structural system with the needs to to, to uh, service the machinery. And sort of back to some photographs, right? Here's a zoomed in picture of this small turntable on top of the big turntable. Once again, all structural steel framing to resist torsional loads, gravity loads, seismic loads, you name it. And we have, for the machinery, we have to design for normal operating conditions as well as um, worst case, if the, if the motor locks up or the brakes suddenly engage. And on the right is just a view of the lift machine, which is a custom uh, chain driven machine. And here's a view of, of the, uh, the carousel at night. This is a photograph, not a rendering. Um, there is a, about a two and a half year delay in, in the project that be, as the creative designer was working on the lighting and the materials for the fish to make them as beautiful as possible. Um, it was a big challenge to maintain all the equipment under, you know, in the, in the cellar for several years while not being used. So any questions about the carousel? Once again, a lot of steel. Yes? So you have mechanical engineers on this also? We have, yes, mechanical and structural engineers. And electrical too? Um, we, yes, on this one we had an electrical engineer. And, and it was, it, what's interesting is because of rot, we produced the design, but the way amusement rides are, are done, according to the ASTM amusement ride standards, the ride manufacturer is responsible for the engineering. So the ride manufacturer had his own engineering team. But the way we did this was basically don't deviate from our design. Just validate that it works and you use your stamp. <laughs> um, there were, was one major change that was an a, a excellent change that they made. Uh, and their electrical engineers dealt with the, you know, with the power and, and uh, sourcing, handling the audiovisual as well as, as the control system. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The large turntable is 46 foot diameter, small were 17. And when that thing was spinning, it, it, it moved. Yeah, it really moves. Any other questions? All right. 
let's go around the world again. Okay, this is uh, the Sentosa Crane Dance in uh, Singapore. You are not looking at a rendering. You're looking at a photograph at night. Um, these are cranes that are supposed to look like cranes. Okay, I'll explain this. Okay, the crane is the national bird of, of uh, Singapore. And so this is a nighttime spectacular, sort of like what you have at Epcot in, in Orlando, you know, at Disney, where they put on a big show for the public. So these are two bird-looking animatronics that emulate cranes, and they do a dance with one another. But functionally, they're somewhat like construction cranes. So it's, you know, it's a crane that's a crane. Um, very intense design. So from the base to the top is more than 80 feet. These are very large steel structures, hydraulic actuators to raise these into position. This is a big LED screen that rides on its breast. These wings, can anybody take a guess what the wings are made out of? Water. Great, good. Salt water, okay, perfect thing for structural steel. Okay, we actually uh, specified that after each show, it would then spray itself with fresh water. I don't know if they're actually doing that. I hope they are. Um, and then there's some other material for the head. It was kind of shiny material, but everything else is steel. And notice that there, were the, there are you know, sort of fancy curves. So the configuration was not the optimal structural design. It was really what worked for the aesthetics. Um, these are um, some interim views of the collapsed position and the erected position of a crane. The it retracts onto itself for storage during off hours. So uh, during hurricanes, you know, big storm events, we retract it and we actually tell them they have to lock it down. So that the erected position, it's not handling typhoon winds, but it's handling, you know, relatively modest winds. Fortunately, with the hydraulics, um, if there are problems with the controls, you can bleed the oil, and in a reasonable period of time, this thing will come down. Notice that we're, you know, we're doing as much triangulation as we can with the, uh, with the structural framework. Um, this, and it, right here, we have a, a ring bearing at the base, another crane bearing to let it rotate. And then here is a base that holds a hydraulic actuator that raises the bottom. In this hip area, another hydraulic actuator that articulates the upper body. This LED screen also articulates to flat. At least our design had that. It may have been value engineered out. And then this head spins and, and bobs up and down. So we had to deliver electrical power and hydraulic power to all of these elements. We had to deliver water. We had to deliver um, lighting elements throughout a structure which is totally exposed to the elements and also exposed to view. Just some other fun images of this. They're, they're one's, one's you know, taking a dominant position and the other's bowing. Um, and uh, the pretty big range of motion. Um, range of motion studies for us in, in the mechanical part are very challenging because we have to, everything has to, has to work within that range of motion and the actuators have to work within that range of motion as well. And very often, we're looking at the human body as a great example of what you can and can't do. And sometimes we'll get ourselves tied up in knots and then start doing this and then you see something that's a really good system and then you get inspired by the human body for how to make things work. Um, and the farther the range of motion, the more difficult it can be. Here's another picture. Here they're now bowing to each other and professing their love for one another. Um, but you'll, you can see, you, you really can't see the base, but I'll, I'll show you that in one of the images. Well, one of the next images. Here are some pictures of the, uh, the main structures in steel. Um, this, we, unfortunately, the value engineering included getting rid of the engineer of record and just building it. So we don't know if they follow our requirements for painting. And we hope they follow our requirements for quality control with welding. Um, we have our fingers crossed. Unfortunately, that happens with projects that are not uh, you know, done in North America. But you can see some very large structural steel elements. 
um, a lot of tubular elements. Of course, we, you know, with these strange geometries, we're very often using tubes because it's you know, the most robust cross-section. Um, and they can be bent to, you know, to very attractive forms. This, by the way, is an aluminum head that eventually gets bolted onto here, the, the top of the neck. And this is uh, one of our drawings um, kind of farther along than those earlier ones, showing the erected uh, pair of cranes with a you know, hydraulic actuator. This detail is blown up to the right. Just to show you the level of detail that we, we need to go through, there, there are all sorts of gussets um, and, and stiffeners in this detail. You know, this element right whoop, here is holding the hydraulic actuator. This is the, holding the pin about which the lower body rotates. And those are pretty close together. So there's a compromise. How, you know, how much leverage do you want? Uh, can you, how much leverage do you absolutely have to have as a trade-off to how much hydraulic power and how big the hydraulics have to be to make that move? And as similar to construction cranes, very often the geometry wins and the hydraulic power gets cranked up to, to make up for, for not having, not taking advantage of the most, um, uh, the best you know, force couples that you, that you could to keep it compact. Also, long hydraulic actuators could be difficult to deal with. So, and this is all sitting on a, a, a purpose-built, uh, call it island, out in the harbor. Uh, we did all of the, our marine division, we also do marine work, did all of the design of, of the piles and this purpose-built structure that supports all of this. And when it comes down, Right here is where the, the, the hip rests on, on, a, on a little stand when it's in the parked position. Okay, any questions about the Sentosa crane dance? Yes? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The height? It, when it's up, it's, it's a little more than 80 feet. I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty hearing you. I'm sorry, the aluminum? Uh, I, I, I understand that AISB is probably recording what I'm saying, but if you at all consider using aluminum for the frame because of the closest environment? No. Um, the aluminum, first of all, if you weld aluminum, the fatigue problems are going to, are going to just haunt you forever. Number two, we were afraid of doing aluminum in Asia because the quality control has to be that much higher than with steel, because it's a much more challenging um, element to, to weld. Um, we knew there were many more qualified fabricators in, in Asia to deal with, with structural steel. We wanted the uh, fatigue resistance of structural steel. Aluminum doesn't have an endurance limit. So, uh, you know, our opinion, and, and the stiffness was a huge issue. We didn't want these things flopping over and then the LED screens not looking good. So. We very quickly said that aluminum is not even under consideration. It had to be structural steel. So you have to deal with corrosion. And you had to have a, a, a high quality paint system. We wanted it to be hot dip galvanized. We lost that battle. Um, and so we settled on high quality paint and, and uh, washing itself off with, with uh, fresh water every day. So any other questions? OK. Let's go to theater. Here's my disclaimer or my issue with theater. We do lots of great, exciting, wonderful stuff with theater, and none of it is interesting on, in a photograph. It's a bunch of cables. It's a bunch of stuff hidden behind some scenery. Um, it's some beams with, you know, and it's dirty. So I went through a couple hundred photographs of theater, and nothing of the steel was exciting. So I found a little bit. This is in, uh, Rocky the Musical. It was in the Winter Garden Theater. Um, it came on the heels of Mamma Mia, leaving the theater. And so this is a, an, a photograph from the scenic studio. So you can see, you know, a building column and a building column and, you know, the lift. And the Rocky the Musical had, it was an industrial look on stage. So it was all in industrial looking steel. And in the old days, it would have been, you know, welded together aluminum or wood, painted to look like steel with plastic 
rivets, and now it's actually steel. Although, I th if there are rivets, they're probably plastic, you know, and painted. But um, in, if this set was, was very large on, sta on the stage, and this is a big uh, gantry crane that traverses up and down stage during the show, and it supports the boxing ring. So the boxing ring hangs from winches, and it gets lowered to the stage, but it, it plays in two positions. Sometimes it comes, one scene, it comes down vertically, and they project on it. Another scene, it comes down flat, then they detach it, and, and then it's on a wagon that then gets pushed out into the audience, and they have the main fight in the audience. Um, the, the, you know, the presentation was quite good. Um, that's the boxing ring, okay? But you're seeing it under construction in the shop. Um, this is just a, a close-up of the gantry crane. Um, you can see all of our fake rivets. This is all welded together. Okay. I had an experience once in one of the shops when I was very, you know, right at the beginning of my, in my career in entertainment, and there was this massive steel beam sticking out of the, out of the dumpster. And I looked at it. I said, wow, look at that thing. I, how did you get it in there? And the guy walked over to it and picked it up. It was foam. In this case, it's all real. So here's another image of the boxing ring. I tried to get a good picture of the boxing ring actually in use in the theater, and it was fuzzy and dusty. So I, I apologize, I wasn't able to get that. But you can see that the, here's uh, the machinery up above, and here's the cable supporting it. And you know, eventually, this got outfit as the uh, as the boxing ring. Okay, here's another show. This, this photo was taken, I took this photo last weekend, uh, or a weekend and a half ago, in Seattle. Uh, this is a show in which they are basically doing black box theater in a regular legitimate theater. They're bringing, the entire stage environment spreads out into the auditorium, and all the seating for the public is blended, both on the stage and the auditorium, as one. And they've wanted to... The, the uh, producers really wanted to, to do this in the theater to show what can be done. Um, it's a high earthquake zone. We have two levels of audience on these seating platforms, and we almost had 300 people in these areas, which would have meant you know, higher importance factors. Um, the building department said, this is in for 60 days. That exceeds our 30-day limit for temporary. This is a permanent building. And all of a sudden, we're telling our client, oh, we're, you're making a permanent building out of steel. And it got a little, little ugly. Um, after a little bit of negotiation with the building department, they let us use some fire-treated lumber. But there was a lot of steel. So you can see, you know, yes, this is a show up for, you know, for two months. That's an eight-by-eight eight structural steel. Once again, some of the issues that, you know, we're contending with are architecturally exposed systems. Seeing a bolt is not bad, but having these plates stick out, actually farther down, stick out in an area where the public would want to see is a problem. So we had to make very compact connections through bolts, through all the columns. And in order to stabilize all of this, we ended up making portal, a portal frame system out of it. So we did a little creative uh, kind of putting together different industries. So these are aluminum rock and roll style trusses that were custom made for this project and they connect with, with moment connections to the tops of the columns. But there's, you can't bring a crane into a theater, so we, we ended up, uh, uh, you can see right here, this is a mast that has an arm sticking out with a, with a, with a uh, chain motor. And it was basically, we used all the chain motors to lift the entire truss assembly up and then people on lifts will go up and connect the truss assembly with these flat plates with slots to the columns using slip critical bolt, uh, A325 bolts in order to make a portal frame. But once again, here's a, about 80,000 pounds of steel in a theater for a two-month show. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to show you one more slide, and then I'm going to open to questions. We have just a few minutes. This is just to give you a a view of what it looks like on the gridiron of a theater. This is above the stage. I just thought it'd be fun to show you how crazy it gets with the cable rigging up in a theater and, and to make these shows work. Um, 
Any other questions about uh, the use of steel in entertainment? Yes? How do you train new engineers? The hard way. Um, that's, that is actually, that's a good question. That's one of our real challenges because everybody that we bring into our work has huge deficiencies relative to what we do. The structural engineers don't know anything about how the, what the machines do to the structures. The mechanical engineers don't know how we you know, engineer structures the way we do in the structural world. And the theater people, we have some technical theater people, don't know engineering. And all the engineers are totally unfamiliar with the practices. So a lot of it is on the job training. We take them out in the field. We, uh, we, we have a lot of discussions with them. And we expose them to the, the, uh, the scenic contractors and the technical directors. And there's a lot of interaction with the client and, uh, on how things get done. Because the traditional parameters that will influence design in buildings, um, you know, is about this amount of stuff. And in the entertainment, it's, it's a lot wider. I mean, it may be sometimes um, a design is all about how much time it takes to load out a show. On the, the Roger Waters' The Wall Tour, for example, they spent a million bucks on a flying rig. It, took, it, it lengthened their load out by 45 minutes, so they cut the act because they couldn't afford the 45 minutes. Okay. So the, tr it, it, it's a lot of, it, it, the training is a lot of on-the-job training. Yeah. Matt, are we out of time? We're right there. Okay. Well, if there, are there any other questions? Uh, which country was, uh, so, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? Well, I'm sorry. The room is tough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would say the dragon because we were scrutinized by TUV. That was perhaps the most, or, I have more pictures. Not that, not that, that. Moving, transforming architecture. I'm standing in the same spot, and that's during a show. On the left is a, a dome in the floor and a dome in the ceiling, and then these open up to create a tree that lifts up and a chandelier that comes down, and a couple other effects. That was challenging. So, uh, I saw one more hand here. I'm, I'm sure there's an, we ha I would love to work in American Ninja Warriors. We haven't worked in any of their, we gave a proposal for one of theirs. Uh, they must have someone, you know, who's qualified doing the work. But if you notice, they're using a lot of rock and roll style truss in their work, which is, which is a wise way to do it because you're renting the equipment rather than building it custom for the most part. Okay. Um, the PDH code, 62446. Just make sure you get your PDH credits. And I want to thank you. The questions were fantastic. I appreciate the you know, involvement of all of you, and I hope you enjoyed it.